As we continue to work on our ongoing spider silk project, there's a process you've seen us use, but up until now we haven't taken the time to go through it in detail. That process is gel electrophoresis. As molecular biology techniques go, this one is about as ubiquitous as they get, simply because of how versatile and straightforward it is. The basic concept is that you get a slab of a special gel, put something you want to separate into pre-made holes in that gel, then use electricity to pull your substance through it. As you do this, whatever mixture of stuff you put in there will spread out as lighter molecules move through the gel faster, and will end up closer to the bottom. This can tell you all sorts of stuff about the sample you're running, including if PCR reactions worked, if you've managed to isolate a particular protein, and so much more. So today we're going to take a dive into some basics of electrophoresis and how to build a gel box for super cheap. Our focus today will be on DNA and agarose-based gels, but we'll come back to separating proteins in a later video when it comes time to test our silk and confirm if we manage to make silk properly. We also won't be covering blotting today, as that's a huge topic in and of itself. When it comes to electrophoresis, there's a few things you'll need. The first is the gel box itself. This is basically just a tank that you can fill up with electrolyte that has a pair of electrodes in it and a place to put the gel in between them. You'll also need a power supply to provide the voltage to that box. Then you'll need a casting tray and comb, which is what you use to prepare the gel before you transfer it to the gel box. And finally, you'll need a collection of reagents to prepare your sample, and also to act as a control, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Let's start simple. Where do you actually get a gel box? Well, the most obvious answer is that you just buy one. They tend to be rather expensive though for what they are, so be prepared to spend upwards of 300 for what amounts to an acrylic box. When you buy a box, it usually comes with a whole kit and includes the casting tray, combs, and often a power supply that's perfectly matched to the box. This is one of the nice parts about buying one, as every piece is made to work with the rest. Recently, we've been using Vesta's Mini One, which is a great little self-contained system, especially for the price. But if you've watched this channel for any length of time, you know that I'm not going to spend $350 on a box. So recently, I finally got around to building one of my own. I went to the dollar store and picked up a drawer organizer tray and a matching smaller box for casting gels in. And just for fun, I picked up this Tupperware container made of fluorescent orange plastic, which I'll try using in an upcoming build, which I'll talk about later. In total, this costs all of $4. The only other thing I need was some graphite electrodes, which I bought on Amazon for 10 bucks for a pack of five. Now, you don't need graphite, and can totally get by with something simpler, like aluminum foil. But then you need to change the foil after every use, and I wanted something that would last, hence the graphite. To build the box, I first laid everything out to mark out how I wanted things to fit together. Then I drilled two holes in the side of the tray for the electrodes, and used a file to clean up the holes and make the rods fit nicely. Then a bit of five minute epoxy was used to hold them in place. While that was curing, I used a bit of scrap copper to make two conductive brackets for connecting some wires to the rods. This is probably overkill, but again, I was going for a nice box that had last and had some spare copper lying around. Once the epoxy was fully cured, I added the brackets and used them to attach a wire to each rod, then bolted everything together tightly, though of course being gentle so as not to crack the rods. As a finishing touch, I added a bit of heat shrink tubing on top to help protect the copper from the electrolyte solution if there's any splashes. I was lucky and found this clear heat shrink tubing, which I think gave a nice look because you can still see the copper. When that was done, the gel box was complete. For the casting tray, I cut the little box so that it was shorter. I probably should have shortened it a bit further, and probably will by the next time you see it. The reason for this is because the comb, which is what's used to prepare the special holes in the gel, needs to rest on the edges of the casting tray. Ideally, it should sit so that there's a 2-3mm to gap between the bottom of the comb and the bottom of the tray, but mine is a bit too high. As for the comb itself, I actually had one lying around from the bento lab, which I modified with a scroll saw to fit. But if you don't have one, you can 3D print them, cut them out on a scroll saw, or even with a Dremel if you're careful. You can also buy them if you hunt around a bit. They don't need to be anything special, just smooth plastic so that the gel doesn't get stuck to them and can be removed cleanly from the set gel. And with that, we're basically done. For our first test, I'm using a benchtop power supply, but this wasn't actually strong enough. The general rule is that you need 1 volt per millimeter of length of gel. My casting tray is about 60 millimeters long, so I need about 60 volts, which is double what my power supply can put out. If you don't have enough voltage, all that ends up happening is that things move slower. In theory, this isn't a huge issue, but you can have issues where your reagents diffuse out of the gel and you lose things if it takes too long. In terms of the gel, the material we use is called agarose. It's a long chain polysaccharide, not unlike starch, but it dissolves in water easily with a bit of quick heat from a microwave. Generally, you'll use a 1-2.5% to gel. The concentration is something you'll need to dial in for your particular setup, though. The lower the concentration, the faster the stuff moves through the gel, which can be good, but can give poor separation of whatever you're testing. For the mini one, we use a 2% gel, but for my new box, a 1% gel worked well. Since we're focusing on testing DNA today, there's one other thing you need to add to your agarose solution before you cast it, which is gel stain. 
This is a dye that will bind to DNA and glow when you shine a UV light on it. This is how we can analyze what's going on and the results when everything is done. The original stain that people used is Ethidium bromide, but no one uses that anymore because it's really carcinogenic. Unsurprisingly, the thing that sticks to DNA isn't great when that DNA is something that's still alive. These days, people use safer dyes like gel green or the cyber safe stains. Still, avoid getting them on you and wear gloves when handling things, but it's not nearly as bad as Ethidium bromide. The concentration you add will be listed on the dye, so check the package to know how much you add. Normally, it's only a few microliters of dye for every 100 mils worth of gel. The stuff is really potent, so you don't need a lot. Another reason to always wear gloves when handling this stuff is that you're naturally covered in enzymes called DNAs that destroys DNA, so you don't want any of that getting into your test solutions. Moving right along, with the gel solution made, microwave it to melt everything, and then cast your gel. Also, don't forget to place your combs near one end of the gel. Not all the way at the edge, though. Leave a bit of a gap so that you get holes and not notches. The gel doesn't need to be particularly thick, just enough that the wells are 3 to 5 millimeters deep. Once that's cool, gently remove the comb and transfer the gel to the gel box. Then we fill the box with an electrolyte. In this case, we're using TAE solution, which is a mixture of trishydrochloride, acetic acid, and EDTA. You can mix your own TAE, but I just bought a 50x bottle and diluted it with distilled water. This bottle will last for ages, and you can reuse the buffer up to four times before it needs to be replaced. Add enough buffer to cover the gel with 3 to 4 millimeters of liquid, and so that the electrodes are covered. Finally, it's time to load up the gel. The day we filmed this, we were testing the Bento Labs PCR machine with a reaction that should work, so that's going to be our test sample. To run a gel, we also need two other things, loading dye and ladder. Loading dye is a mixture of a blue dye and glycerin that serves two purposes. First, the dye is fairly light, so it will always move through the gel faster than everything else. Since it doesn't need a UV light to be seen, we use this to know when things are getting close to the bottom of the gel and when we need to turn off the power. Secondly, the glycerin adds density so that when we mix it with our sample and go to pipette it into the wells, it sinks into the hole and doesn't just float away. The latter, on the other hand, is our control sample. It's made of a mixture of DNA fragments of known size, and it'll spread out into a series of stripes. You can get ladder in all sorts of sizes, and in a future video we'll actually be looking at how we can make our own. But today we'll be using a 100 base pair ladder. This means the lowest rung is 100 base pairs, and the highest is 1000. So by comparing any stripes we get in our test sample to the ladder, we'll know how big it is. Often ladder comes pre-mixed with loading dye, so you don't need to add more. 3-4 to four microliters can be pipetted directly into the first well. For our test sample, we first cut a piece of parafilm to mix our sample on, and then pipette 2 microliters of dye onto it to form a droplet. Then we add 2-3 to three microliters of our reaction mixture to the droplet and pipette up and down a few times to mix things. Then suck up the droplet and transfer it to the empty well, being sure to eject the liquid slowly directly into the well. We're only doing the one sample here, but in other runs we filled every well of a gel and we'll prepare a line of samples, making sure to note down the order we have our samples in so that we know what we're looking at later. After that, just turn on the power and let it run. Always make sure the black wire or negative is at the end of the gel where the holes are. DNA is negatively charged, so we pull it towards the positively charged electrode. In this shot, it looks like we've got it backwards, but that's just because the gel box is facing the other way so we don't clutter our workspace. The electrodes themselves are connected properly relative to the direction of the gel. Now, I'd love to show you the results of this gel from the first time we ran it, but the talk from the researcher who claimed to have CRISPR modified a pair of twin babies was on, and honestly, I was too distracted to remember to film it. The last thing we need to talk about is how you actually visualize the gel when it's done. In systems like the Mini One, there's a bluish or UV light built into the box and an orange lid which blocks the UV, allowing the fluorescence from the gel stain to shine through. This is known as a transilluminator. This is why I picked up that orange Tupperware, to act as a UV shield. I'm not sure if it really works though, so I'll keep you posted on that. Honestly, I don't really like these on their own. Your caveman eyeballs just aren't good at picking up the relatively small amount of light emitted by your sample, so at times it can be really hard to see if something worked. That's not to say it's impossible, not by any means. Lots of my friends get by like this with no issues. Just make sure the whole room is dark, and it makes seeing things a lot easier. However, the proper way to do this is with a device called a gel dock. Basically, it's just a transilluminator, but inside a lightproof box and with a far better camera mounted at the top. There's a nice filter on the camera that blocks the UV better than the cheap plastic does, and since the camera can take long exposures and adjust contrast and lots of other little tweaks, even the faintest bands can be seen. Since we desperately need a gel dock for the lab, I'll be building one in the next week or so, and we'll go through that build as soon as I do. Again, a gel dock isn't mandatory, but it's one of those convenience tools that allows far more accurate quantification, which if you plan on publishing any of your work is nice to have and makes things look a lot more professional. And since the lab is always brightly lit, it'll be particularly handy in my case. 
And for those wondering, a gel dock is how we've been getting those super clear black and white gel images I've shown in previous videos. The last quick note is about how to analyze your gel. Let's look at two quick examples, a PCR reaction and a DNA extraction. For PCR, it's really straightforward. When you design primers, you know what size the fragment you're trying to amplify should be. So when you run a gel, you're looking to see if you see a stripe that lines up with the ladder such that it shows you that it's the right size. Though usually if it didn't work, you just won't see anything. Sometimes you'll see stripes of the wrong size, and this means your primers generated a product in a way that you weren't expecting, and you'll likely need to redesign things. Here's an example from a PCR reaction that did work. We were trying to isolate a fragment that's 850 base pairs long. We ran it next to a 100 base pair ladder, and sure enough, we got a stripe exactly where we wanted to see it. The other example is if you're doing DNA extraction. In this case, assuming it worked, you'll see one of two, or sometimes both, of the following. Either you'll see a smear, or a nice band, and sometimes both. A smear means that while you were doing your extraction, something happened and the DNA got shredded to bits, so you may need to redo the extraction more carefully. If you see a band, on the other hand, everything is nicely intact, but again, sometimes you'll see both. Whenever we isolate plasmids, for example, we aim to see a band of the appropriate size. This means we've isolated the plasmid and it's intact and can be used directly. Otherwise, it's back to the lab to run the extraction again and tweak the protocol. This is the issue we've been having with the spiders. When we run the extraction, everything was shredded. A few final notes about things I didn't address because we'll be addressing them in upcoming videos. First, it's possible to extract DNA directly from the gel if you want to isolate a particular piece. It's also possible to move the DNA out of a gel and onto a membrane for further testing, which is called blotting, which as I mentioned at the start will be a topic for another time. And finally, things are a bit different if you're running proteins or RNA. While both can be run on agarose gels, normally you use acrylamide gels for that, which there's a whole song and dance in and of itself, and we'll talk about that another time. But other than that, that's all the basics of electrophoresis. I hope you found this video helpful, and it helped to show that electrophoresis doesn't need to be expensive. Dollar store parts work just as well as an $800 kit. After all, it's just a box. And that's where I'll end this episode. If you enjoyed, be sure to subscribe and ring that bell so YouTube will occasionally maybe remember to send you notifications when I post new videos. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons and channel members who make these videos possible. If you'd like to support the show, then consider joining or becoming a patron, or check out my new store on Teespring. I just added some new designs, and more will be added soon. That's all for now, and I'll see you next time.